As we continue on with our Michael Marsh series, now Michael Marsh himself was somebody that really nobody knew. That's the, kind of the point of this. This was uh, a person who wrote up all kinds of great insights into the scriptures, into the great loud cry of the last day, uplifting the imputed righteousness of Christ, Christ being the light of the world. Now, Michael Marsh himself, who was a very fragile person, in fact, and uh, he died of cancer, and he never really had much of a group of followers. Maybe it's a handful of people during a Bible study class in somebody's home, and that was about it. His church really never took him that serious. Um, even his position in the church as an elder, they would very rarely ever let him get up and speak. But in knowing him and in reading his writings was fascinating because that's where the power really is, like the Apostle Paul. It really didn't look like the whole thing amounted to a whole lot. But the words were mighty. Now, Michael Marsh himself, being a frail man, uh, he was an alcoholic before he gave his life to Christ, gave his life to Christ, and found really his addiction in the person and the study of Christ. He was obsessed with the reality of Christ. Now, at this site that we're at today, in which there's a World War I ship here in Aptos, California, and it was basically, you know, ran aground here, and it's made of cement, and it's been here since World War I, this cement ship. Well, only recently this ship has been toppled over because of these huge storms that came and just toppled the ship. And just like the frail life of Michael Marsh himself, it's very fascinating because his whole message was about the frailty of the human experience, but the reality that we have in Christ. Now, this is the paper that we're going to talk about Michael Marsh in which fundamentally when I called him the last time I talked to him, I said, Michael, is there... Is there something you're working on now, your final work that you're going to do? And he says, ultimately, David, I feel like the Lord is saying that this whole thing summarizes in one particular proclamation of truth. David, Christ is our reality. Now, I thought of the implications of that, and I'm thinking... That is pretty huge to try to get a hold of that. What does he mean? Because this was a man that was very clear about Christ's objective, imputed righteousness. In other words, our righteousness in our life is actually in Christ. Our life is hid in Christ. Our existence in our, in our airship exists in the person of Christ. God doesn't look upon you or me according to what we are in ourselves. God looks at us according to who we are in His Son. God has to look at somebody else's reality to establish, quote, our reality. And this is what's so fascinating about understanding is Christ is our reality because it is the language of the covenant language of the Bible. And it's so much so that when Christ returns, everything melts into, by His fervent heat. Everything breaks back down. He deconstructs everything upon his return. And if you really want to understand the level of how Christ is reality, is to go to Revelation chapter 20 and to understand that at the second resurrection, Christ lets everything turn to its ionic vaporized powder because at some point he declares what is so. And he says, what I am and the kingdom that exists within himself and what he possesses in himself is the reality of the Christian. And not just some kind of an esoteric reality. Nothing exists and will deconstruct. Satan, his angels, the wicked, this world will completely deconstruct at that point. And then it's only by his word that he makes a new heaven and new earth. What endures forever? Christ and what comes out of his mouth, what he declares, because he is that closely identified with his word, his substance. And in fact, it says that all things exist and consist within him in Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. What does that really mean? It literally means that Christ keeps all of this stuff glued together and holds this whole thing together because it's a part of this covenant he made at creation. And it will deconstruct when he decides that after the atonement, he will be making a new heaven 
and a new earth. So when Christ talks about all things exist and consist within him, when he is telling us that when I go to the Father, that I will stand there in your place and that the Father will not look upon you and your righteousness will not look upon what exists in you, but what exists in me will be your standing before God. Now, why is this important in these last days? Because it just so happens that these last days are focused on what's called an ontological reality. In other words, that what exists around us, such as these pillars or that cement ship that toppled over, truly deconstructs at some point that God does not validate that as substance or essence. So that is a very important thing to understand these last days where we are using language even in the Christian world that God is an ever-shifting reality, that God morphosizes into this kind of uh, transitional being. And so what is going on with us as society or as people that God is shifting with it? If society changes, if the moral values of society, of what's expedient changes, God has to change with that. What's fascinating to really understand is that God doesn't think that way. Even the very name Yahweh, which means I am that I am, I exist. And when the scriptures say that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, or when Revelation says that Christ is, was, and is to be, or is to come, that is talking about him as Yahweh, the ever-existing, self-existent, fountain of life and his only resource is himself. Now that's what's so important to understand because the book of James chapter 4 tells us that we aren't that reality. We are but vapor. The scripture's testimony of us is we are of the dust of the ground. That we exist because God has breathed into us the breath, the wind of life that animates us. But we don't possess that reality in ourselves. We exist because we are held by the fingers of God. And the moment he releases us, we deconstruct. We no longer exist. That's the point. That when God says that he is measuring all things against himself, he has measured the heavens by hand's breadth, and he's measuring everything all according to himself. And whatever does not line up with the righteousness and the perfection and the substance and essence of himself, will not exist when he deconstructs this whole thing at the end of time. Why is that so important? Because that's the only thing that's going to matter. In the end of time, the only those that be or exist in the end of time will be those who have obeyed and heard the call to enter in and join into that covenant with God and hide and abide in him where he can replace our vapor experience existence in the covenant reality we go and hide in him and he could stand there as our representative as the substance of all reality that God can appeal to nothing higher on the judgment than Christ himself who is the substance of all reality and say to you and to me you exist in my son Christ because in him is the substance of all reality. It's not in us. We don't possess it. We don't have an immortal soul. We are not immortal beings. These things go away at some point and they don't exist, just like that deconstructed ship. And at some point, we fail. But God says, I never fail, I fail not. God exists and he is the measurement of all reality. And at some point, we're gonna to have to come to terms with that. Christ is reality.